Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. It's my true honor and pleasure to moderate and introduce uh, this uh, two-day uh, Euro webinar uh, held by the European School of Geology Online, which is focused on the WHO 2022 classification on May genital urinary cancer. And uh, this is particularly relevant in the sense that, as you know, it has been just released, the fifth edition of the WHO classification of genital urinary cancers. And there has been many novelties and, and updates, which we believe are completely relevant and important for practicing urologists. So it's my true pleasure for me um, to introduce this webinar. And uh, I have the honor to share uh, this event with three key opinion leaders in the field, worldwide well-known pathologists in the field of GU cancers, Professor Raspolini from Florence, Professor Amin from Los Angeles, United States, and Professor Lobetz Beltran from Lisbon. So uh, today we will have actually these speakers and we will have each presentation lasting about 15 minutes. After each presentation, we will have a five minute slot for questions. And I will encourage you to actually put your questions using the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is accredited with one European CME credit upon your completion of the questionnaire after attending this webinar. Uh, this is the program, and uh, I believe that without any further delay, uh, we can leave the floor to the four speaker, Professor Raspolini from Florence, who will update us about novelties in kidney tumor within the last fifth edition of the WHO classification but more importantly, we will try to put these novelties into context in order to have the highest impact on our practice as urologists and physicians dealing with GU cancers. So please, Professor Raspolini, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes and then we will have five minutes of discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the invitation. Thank you for the presentation. It's my a great pleasure to, to describe the novelties in kidney tumor. And uh, these are my disclosure. And uh, my, my talk, in my talk, I would like to focus on the main issue, uh, on, the, on the news on the, uh, uh, regarding the uh, renal classification and I have listed the main issue in, in the slide. I would like to start with the concept of molecularly defined renal tumor entities, because this is the real uh, new thing in the uh, renal classification of the 2022 uh, edition. Um, from a traditional point of view, the classification of the renal tumor have been made according to the main histological feature. So the presence of clear cell, the find the, the clear cell, renal cell carcinoma, or the presence of papillary feature indicated that the presence of papillary renal cell carcinoma or the, uh, according a genetic basis, the presence of the hereditary leiomatosis renal cell carcinoma. And in the last decade, we tried to find a strong correlation between genotype and phenotype. So looking for the 3P loss in clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the gain of chromosome 7, 17 in papillary renal cell carcinoma, and the, the loss of multiple chromosome in chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. But uh, we realized that uh, sometimes there are some difficulties because uh, there are a lot of renal tumor with clear cell. It's not possible to uh, look for a molecular alteration according to the presence of the clear cell. But there are a lot of renal tumor with papillary feature and a lot of renal tumor with pink cell. 
So the morphology is not enough to, uh, in order to identify the, the molecular finding that is correlated with the, uh, the phenotype. And to introduce the concept of molecular defined renal tumor and entity, I would like to share with you a recent case that I have in the, in the last week in my routinary work. And the slide is uh, referred to a, a tumor, a renal tumor, I grade the renal tumor with characterized by a pink cell. A renal tumor with the expression of PAS8, aggressive tumor, not only for the histology, but also for the presence of micrometastasis in the in a ILAR lymph node. And for the staining of the tumor, the tumor stained with the cytokeratin, uh, with the, the, um, but uh, he had only a focal expression of CK7, a negative expression for CK20. The negativity for the melanocytic market, the negativity for C10, CD10, and the tumor cell showed an expression uh, for the uh, INI1. Uh, Fumarati Dradasi and Succinica Dresenasi marker. So uh, the tumor seems not classifiable according to the, the previous classification, but the employ of another stain, the employ of all market and the support of fish analysis with the demonstration of the ARC gene rearrangement in 2P23 allowed us to do the diagnosis of ALK rearranged renal cell carcinoma. So there are some renal tumor that uh, are not possible to do the diagnosis. For the, this tumor, it's not possible to do the a correct diagnosis only with morphology. It's for this reason that the editorial board of the 22 classification decided to introduce a new entity that are the molecular defined renal carcinomas. Uh, and this is an entity that require the demonstration of the molecular alter alteration that is, that is inside the tumor. There is not a specific molecular, uh, a specific, sorry, a specific morphology that can help us to, to study the tumor from a molecular point of view, but uh, uh, is uh, the identification of the uh, molecular alteration that allow us to do the correct diagnosis. In this time, uh, in this 2022, there is not the the right time to go towards a, a, a real molecular classification for a, a renal cell carcinoma. So there is a, a, a entity, a category is, that is a molecular defined renal cell carcinoma, but there, is, there are also the uh, morphology based renal cell carcinoma. When there is not possible to have the, uh, the demonstration of the molecular alteration, in this case, uh, when the morphology is not enough, the description uh, of, of the tumor can be uh, suggest additional uh, molecular analysis in order to detect the correct di di diagnosis. Sometimes, and many times we should think that the identification of molecular alteration can be the basis for the future of a target therapy in the, uh, in the renal tumor. Um, in this slide, I show you a, a recent paper where there is the description of three patients with uh, ALK renal cell carcinoma metastatic disease that uh, with uh, a very good response to a target therapy with uh, alectinib. Uh, so they, um, they improve that we can from the molecular study can help in the, uh, uh, not only for the diagnosis, but for the, um, for the target therapy in the um, renal cell carcinoma patient. 
but uh, we should uh, keep uh, in mind that uh, uh, surely the uh, molecular uh, uh, finding the renal tumor may be uh, the, the future, the, the, the present, the future, but uh, the morphological data are, uh, um, are, the, are the basis uh, uh, still remained of uh, clinical relevance in the treatment of, can of, of cancer patients. There are some uh, morphological uh, findings, such as the sarcomatoid differentiation in renal cell carcinoma, that is the basis for specific neurotherapy. And uh, uh, this is very important to, to underline in order to, 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 uh, to select the right therapy for the, uh, for the patient with uh, some peculiar morphological findings. And uh, um, the, um, the increasing of the novelties in the renal pathology uh, have changed also the classification of uh, some tumor. Uh, you well know that uh, in the previous classification, both in the 2004 and 20. A16, uh, in, in the chapter uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma, uh, there were two types, type one and type two. Type one that, was, uh, that is characterized by a small basophic cell with uh, a general basophic appearance, a low magnification, with the presence, uh, uh, sometime with the presence of histocyte. Uh, uh, and the type 2 papillary renal carcinoma was described as a high-grade tumor with a, a pink cell, a cell with a high a nuclear grade. But uh, if we look at uh, uh, some diagnosis of the past and uh, we uh, reanalyze some uh, papillary type 2, we can now observe that uh, um, with the help of the uh, molecular help and employ of a specific immunohistochemistry, we can uh, recognize that uh, some cases that in the past have been diagnosed as papillary renal uh, cell carcinoma type 2 are uh, different entities, uh, such as uh, the uh, renal cell carcinoma with deficit uh, of uh, fumarate hydratase or uh, renal cell carcinoma with the TFD amplification, or, um, when, uh, or, or uh, mm, renal cell carcinoma uh, of type eosinophic solid cystic. So the, uh, the improving of the knowledge uh, suggested, suggested to, uh, to avoid the division in papillary one and papillary two, to, uh, to, to identify the uh, 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 papillary renal cell carcinoma and the, um, the classic morphology of finding is uh, a tumor characterized by small cell with a basophic appearance and uh, uh, to, to try to recognize another uh, tumor with the papillary feature if there is possible to identify some peculiar molecular alteration that allow us to, 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 to do a correct definition of the tumor. And uh, so uh, I, um, there are specific uh, new name and new uh, tumor entity. I have uh, um, uh, listed some of, of these in my uh, short presentation. And uh, uh, just to, uh, to show in, in a pitch, uh, in this slide, uh, how many are the, the new entities or the entities that where there is uh, some uh, difference respect to the previous classification. One of the new entity that uh, I, uh, uh, I, I have not speak about this, is the alloc mutate renal cell carcinoma. is a, a tumor that now we know that is a, a tumor that is characterized by the absence of BHL gene. 
and uh, uh, so is uh, is not uh, um, uh, to, uh, really not a clear cell or a cell carcinoma is characterized by the presence of uh, a clear cell and the clear cell are uh, uh, um, uh, together with the fibromuscular uh, cell and the, the uh, demonstration of this tumor may be done only with the documentation of mutation in the ELOX gene at 8 to 21.11. Uh, um, where it is not possible to perform this analysis, we should uh, uh, pay attention because uh, uh, we should uh, be careful to, uh, to separate this entity from uh, renal cell, uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma and uh, respect to another entity that is uh, uh, with a name that is changed respect to the previous, that, that is the clear cell papillary renal cell tumor that uh, is uh, characterized by a strong expression of the CK7, a uh, uh, cup-like expression of uh, carbonic hydratase 9, uh, a negative expression for CD10, a strong expression of high weight uh, cytokeratine such as uh, 34-beta uh, E11, and a negative expression for resinase. Uh, this tumor the, uh, is not a, a new entity with respect to the previous uh, classification, but uh, we had a, a, a change of name the change of name from carcinoma to tumor, uh, because uh, uh, now we have collected uh, uh, a large number of the cases in, in, the, in the literature, and uh, there are no report uh, metastatic event for this uh, indolent tumor. And uh, um, so it's important to recognize uh, uh, this tumor and to do the, the, the right diagnosis respect to other entity that are characterized by a, a different uh, prognosis. Other uh, few words about another entity, uh, just to, do, to, to try to do a sort of uh, do some uh, clear thing about uh, a heterogeneous group that uh, is defined in the 2022 classification, other oncocytic, uh, oncocytic tumor of the kidney. And uh, this uh, uh, heterogeneous group uh, represents uh, uh, something that is not uh, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma or uh, oncocytoma. And, uh, before to speak more, I would like to, uh, to do some definition because uh, oncocytic cells are pink cells, but uh, pink cells are not always oncocytic cells. And the oncocytic cells are characterized by the presence of mitochondria. Uh, it's important to do this distinction because there are a lot of renal tumor with pink cell. I just showed this previous. And so this, uh, uh, this category that you can see in the new classification is a, an, an heterogeneous group uh, is defined as a, uh, oncocytic tumor that are not classifiable as oncocytoma or chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, or other type with the eosinophilic feature. Uh, the tumor may be solitary or multifocal, may be associated, may be sporadic tumor or associated with the genetic syndrome. The main problem is for the pathologist because the pathologist should uh, for the pathologist, there is the need to rule out the diagnosis of uh, oncocytoma and chromophobe renal cell carcinoma and other aggressive entities such as light grade and classified renal, renal cell carcinoma and other malignant tumor. For uh, this uh, uh, broader category, uh, they uh, the current literature data, there are no report aggressive feature, 
uh, more data are needed for the future. And in this moment, in this uh, broader category, there are two emerging uh, entities that are the eosinophilic, evacuolate, the tumor, and the low-grade oncocytic tumor. But uh, in this moment, I think that these represent a, a problem for the pathologist because the, the main problem is to rule out the presence of other aggressive tumor with uh, um, eosinophilic uh, feature. And um, I, I thank you, thank you for, the, for your kind of attention. And uh, I'm happy to, to reply to um, um, your uh, um, question, uh, if uh, any. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, uh, a very comprehensive uh, uh, talk about uh, the novelties uh, in uh, renal cell carcinoma indeed. Uh, uh, again, I would encourage you uh, to put your questions and to type your questions in the question and answer box. And while waiting for the first questions, I might break the ice. We actually have five minutes for discussion, but I'm just trying to take uh, the urological counterpart and to ask for very practical questions. And the first coming to my mind is, um, we actually, despite morphological features being a uh, corner store and uh, still and, and, and very important, we actually are moving towards molecularly defined kidney cancer. So my questions for you as, as a urologist is, uh, when uh, such uh, molecular analyses are actually indicated uh, in the everyday practice when we encounter uh, um, kidney cancer or for example, an a, 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 a diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma, uh, when there, is there any indication for further molecular assessment? Um, when the uh, molecular, the morphology findings are not so clear. I mean, um, um, uh, a uropathology with uh, experience in uh, kidney cancer uh, should be, be able to recognize uh, some morphological uh, findings that are enough to do a correct diagnosis. In other cases, when there are some uh, uh, morphological findings that are not so clear, that may be ambiguous, that they may be, um, may be cause, required a differential diagnosis, you should, be, uh, should know that uh, you should go on with the employ of immunosochemistry, with the employ of molecular analysis. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, you can uh, get a diagnosis that can be useful for, for the patient. So, so thank you. So a very practical question coming from the audience this time is uh, it's something which I believe is 100% correct. Does every pathology lab have the possibility to do all these analyses to come to the diagnosis and new classification? And I think that this opens the door, I believe, to the topic of potentially referral some of these patients to tertiary referral labs or to centers where there is high involvement in the pathology assessment of GU cancers. Is this something which is happening in the pathology world as well? Um, I think that is not possible for every lab to perform all the molecular analysis that now we can do on the kidney cancer. But uh, uh, this is an issue that uh, also uh, we discussed uh, inside the editorial board. And uh, there, are, uh, me, there are a lot of morphological uh, feature that we should uh, keep in account uh, for the diagnosis. And sometimes uh, uh, when uh, there is the suspicion for the, for the pathologist that uh, is required additional uh, analysis, we should keep in account that uh, we can move the tissue block in, a, in another center in order to have the final diagnosis. But we, sh we should know that uh, there are a lot of uh, data that we can have from morphology. The, uh, the grade of the tumor, the, the presence of, uh, of necrosis, the presence of extension 
design uh, the, the renal um, capsule. So there are a lot of uh, uh, morphological data that can help the pathologist in every center to, uh, to do the, uh, a good diagnosis. Sometimes there is the need to perform additional analysis, but uh, we can move the tissue block, not the patient, in order to have a final diagnosis. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We are receiving many questions, by the way, which you find the QA box in the bottom of the screen. Unfortunately, time is running and uh, it's time now to move uh, to the next presentation, but I'll, uh, I will kindly ask to Professor Raspolini indeed to actually answer to the questions uh, that the audience have already posed during your talk. There are many and many are extremely interesting. Uh, however, in the interest of time, we need to move to the next talk, which is in indeed dealing, instead dealing with prostate cancer and uh, we will have Professor Amin from Los Angeles, USA, who will uh, update us about the novelties of uh, prostate cancer classifications in the last edition of the WHO in GU pathology. This is a pre-recorded lecture, so I will kindly ask technicians to actually start with the presentation by Professor Amin, and then we will have five minute discussion. Thank you. Good evening. This is Dr. Mehul Amin, and it is my distinct pleasure to be presenting to you this evening the summary of the proceedings in changes in prostate cancer nomenclature as outlined in the WHO fifth edition of the Blue Book. My title is Novelties in Prostate Tumors fifth edition WHO Blue Book. Here are my financial disclosures. I will not be promoting any products directly. We now know that the precursor lesions of the prostate, the ones that we can recognize microscopically, are prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. In the past, pathologists would designate high-grade PIN, lesions in which the nuclear features resembled adenocarcinoma of prostate and low-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, which had very poor intra-observer reproducibility. We did not know much about its molecular, biological, or clinical significance. Hence, in the fifth edition of the WHO, the term low-grade PIN is dropped, and there is only one grade, not low-grade and high-grade PIN, but just prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. So if you see high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia or just PIN, it refers to the precursor lesion of adenocarcinoma prostate. Additionally, we as pathologists would have different patterns of prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. We usually did not record these different patterns of prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia here a micropapillary, a tufting, and a flat and a cribriform pattern. But the reason I mention this is just something that urologists should be aware of, is that the WHO does not recommend that pathologists call cribriform morphology with PIN as PIN. But whenever we see cribriform morphology of PIN, it is believed to be intraductal carcinoma or intraductal growth. That is acinar carcinoma that grows into pre-existing ducts. So this is referred to as intraductal carcinoma of the prostate. In the prior edition, 2015 version, the fourth edition, intraductal carcinoma of prostate was formally recognized. And even in its pure form was a pathology that could warrant treatment either as a radical prostatectomy without invasive carcinoma or just radiation therapy. Now, this is therefore the pre-existing ducts and this is adenocarcinoma growing into pre-existing ducts, hence intraductal carcinoma. Now, intraductal carcinoma can be seen in needle biopsies. If it is seen in needle biopsies in a pure form, it is associated with an adverse, adverse finding. If it is seen with invasive cancer, the invasive cancer is invariably high grade, high volume disease, and therefore is an aggressive 
uh, pathology finding. In radical prostatectomies, if one sees invasive cancer, along with intraductal carcinoma, there is a greater probability of extra prostatic extension association by, with biochemical recurrence, such that when pathologists see intraductal carcinoma with invasive cancer, either in needle biopsies or radical prostatectomies, the recommendation is that we should report this because this conveys an adverse prognosis. Now, so since we now understand the concept of intraductal carcinoma, it is very important that pathologists and therefore urologists understand that the distinction between high-grade prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasia and intraductal carcinoma just on looking at slides is not always clear-cut. And it is very important that pathologists recognize high-grade PIN, now called PIN, and not confuse it with intraductal carcinoma because high-grade PIN is a precursor lesion versus intraductal carcinoma is a lesion that has adverse prognosis and should be treated. Now, sometimes we as pathologists will find lesions that fall short of PIN. I mean, they, they fall short of intraductal carcinoma. They are at least high-grade PIN, but they have features that make us worry that this could be intraductal carcinoma because intraductal carcinoma is an adverse prognosis but we cannot call it intraductal carcinoma in some scenarios. WHO now recommends the term atypical intraductal proliferation. This is a term when used, the pathologist wants to convey that there is an intraductal proliferation. This intraductal proliferation exceeds PIN, but falls short of intraductal carcinoma. And therefore it is important here not to forget it like PIN, and not to treat it like intraductal carcinoma, but at least have an immediate rebiopsy and follow up. So the classification of prostate cancer in the WHO 2022 can be divided into those tumors that are glandular. And here is the classification, acinar, ductal, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. Carcinomas could be of squamous histology, squamous and adenosquamous, and adenoid cystic carcinoma, previously called basal cell carcinoma. Now, what did the WHO do in terms of Gleason grading? Well, the last time in the fourth edition, the whole concept of grade grouping was given. This time, what has been accumulated in the literature through studies, both clinical and pathologic, is that cribriform cancers and cribriform morphology in invasive cancer is a bad finding. In radical prostatectomy, it is correlated with lower rates of survival. In pretreatment biopsies, it is predictive of advanced stage. And it has very distinct molecular alterations that are more of the adverse type than seen in the other cancers that do not typically progress. There's also increased genom genomic instability and more frequent mutations of SPOP and ATM, et cetera, that are increased when compared to non cribriform carcinoma. So the message here is that cribriform morphology when seen in prostate cancer is an adverse prognosis because it is still a Gleason pattern 4, but Gleason pattern 4 could be fused glands. Any pattern 4 is adverse histology, but when you see cribriform glands, that is an even additional sign of adverse prognosis. Another feature that the WHO fifth edition deals with in terms of Gleason grading is the controversy of grading intraductal carcinoma. Now the pathology community, the urologic pathology community is very lucky that there are two societies, the International Society of Urologic Pathology and the Genital Urinary Pathology Society. However, the two societies have different views in handling intraductal carcinoma when associated with invasive cancer. The two societies agree that when intraductal carcinoma is in its pure form, it should not be graded. However, when it is with invasive carcinoma, what the ISUP recommends is that the intraductal carcinoma component should be just be grouped with the invasive cancer and incorporated in the quantification as well as in the Gleason scoring. The GUPS, on the other hand, while it agrees with ISO that intraductal carcinoma should not be graded, and this was 
something that everybody has had agreement with. The main changes in GUPS is that in patients with prostate cancer, if one sees intraductal carcinoma, and if that intraductal carcinoma's presence will change the Gleason scoring on biopsy or radical prostatectomy, it should not be included. So ISO would include it, GUPS would not include it. What is the message for urolog urologists? Well, it is important to understand whether your pathologist is using the criteria of ISO or using the criteria of CUPS. This difference, although significant in criteria, involves less than three to 5% of cancers, in fact, probably much lower, but it's something that we would like you to be alerted of, and please have a communication with the pathologist as which, path, which criteria they're using. Now, the WHO is all about classification. And while asthma carcinoma is the most common type of adenocarcinoma, there are unusual histologic patterns that are recognized. These are some things in morphology that the pathologist sees. Often we don't even record them. Here is a adenocarcinoma and the pathologist did a stain called P63, which is expected to be negative in adenocarcinoma. However, sometimes we see P63 positivity, so this is called an aberrant P63 positive adenocarcinoma. Here is an adenocarcinoma that, unlike the small asthenocarcinoma, looks like BP8, so it's called pseudo-hyperplastic adenocarcinoma. These are still asthenar adenocarcinomas of the prostate. Now, in the past, we used to call variants of prostate cancer. The WHO has dropped the term variants because variance is frequently used for a molecular alteration and has recommended the term subtypes. Here are the different subtypes of asnar carcinoma of prostate. Signaturing, sarcomatoid, pleomorphic giant cell, which is very rare, and this pin-like carcinoma. What is pin-like carcinoma? It is a carcinoma that looks like pin, so it's important that the pathologist recognizes that it's not pain, but it's actually invasive cancer. So it's a pin-like carcinoma. And the point we would like to make is that some, there's some literature that said that these pin-like carcinomas are more like ductal carcinoma. The WHO now recognizes that the pin-like carcinomas are more like Gleason 3 plus 3 grade group 1, and therefore the term ductal is dropped. So the term should be pin-like adenocarcinoma, which is still a subtype of asner carcinoma. So this is pin-like morphology. Once we do immunohistochemistry and prove an absence basal cell layer, we do not call it pin-like ductal carcinoma, but we call it pin-like carcinoma because if you use the term ductal, it's a poor prognosis. As I mentioned, there's asner carcinoma and ductal carcinoma. Ductal carcinoma of prostate still exists. There was some discussion whether it is unique from asner carcinoma or not. But morphologically, we know that ductal carcinomas have a large asthenar morphology with a cribriform or comedo pattern, and that there has some similarities with asthenar carcinomas. It has ERG re rearrangements, SPOP and FOX1, A1 driver mutations. But there are some differences. First, in addition to the morphology, they have a lower frequency of ERG mutations. They have more aberrations in DNA repair genes, including the homologous recombinant pathway. And the ductal pattern here is a lung tissue with metastatic prostate cancer. The ductal pattern is associated with high stage disease, frequent distant metastasis, often to unusual site with increased biochemical failure. So ductal carcinoma prostate is an adverse histology adenocarcinoma of prostate. The WHO also discusses neuroendocrine carcinoma. As you all know, as clinicians, we are seeing more of neuroendocrine carcinomas because of the ability for high potency anti-androgen drugs that shut down the androgen pathway and result in the emergence of an androgen independent clone, which is called the neuroendocrine phenotype. This neuroendocrine carcinoma, most frequently small cell carcinoma, occurs within 24 months uh, of the antiandrogen treatment. Uh, it is associated with poor prognosis and believed to be transdifferentiation of that asthma carcinoma where the antiandrogen shuts down the androgen pathway and there is an androgen resistance and a neuroendocrine phenotype that 
evolves due to TP53, RB, and P10 loss. So here is an example of a small cell carcinoma, which has transdifferentiated from this Asner carcinoma here on this side with cribriform morphology. Additionally, as I mentioned, there is a basal cell carcinoma of the prostate. This is now called adenoid cystic basal cell carcinoma because this carcinoma has the same fish alterations with the MIB and FIB fusion alterations that we see in adenoid cystic carcinoma of the salivary gland. Hence, the term is adenoid cystic basal cell carcinoma of the prostate. These are believed to be adenocarcinomas or carcinomas that arise from the basal cells. These are not carcinomas that arise from the acinar cells, but as adenocarcinomas from the basal cells. Finally, the WHO talks a lot about the enhanced understanding of the molecular underpinnings of prostate cancer. There are separate chapters on hereditary tumor syndromes associated with prostate cancer. Those associated with homologous recombinant pathway genes, the BRCA2, BRCA1, ATM defects. And this is important to identify because those patients with high grade cancers and metastatic disease could respond to PARP inhibitors. There are a subset of prostate cancers associated with Lynch syndrome, germline mutation in the DNA mispair repair genes. And these patients, instead of PARP inhibitors, respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. The WHO also recognizes that the family history is no longer the most important gauge of risk of prostate cancer, but germline mutations is necessary. And they are often found in, even in patients with no history of prostate cancer. Finally, there are some guidelines that recommend that intraductal carcinoma of prostate and cribriform carcinoma, so this intraductal carcinoma and cribriform cancer should be tested with uh, for inherited germline alterations. The current WHO has not taken a stand on whether cribriform pattern 4 or IDCP should be tested, and this is left to the individual urologist and the guidelines that the urologist to, chooses to follow. With that, uh, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and thank you for your time. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Amin. It was a, a very nice presentation about uh, updates on prostate cancer within the WHO fifth edition. This was a pre-recorded presentation, so we won't have the chance to, to actually uh, put questions to Professor Amin. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, my general question, if I may, uh, on prostate cancer, and maybe Professor Bertrand, Professor Raspolini can ask, what is, I mean, if you look at the general report from prostate cancer, like radical prostatectomy specimen, what, does, what are the minimal requirements that sh we should aim at, in addition, of course, to the uh, Gleason grading, whether we should always report pre presence of cribriform partner or concomitant presence of introductive carcinoma. So what would you suggest or what do you indicate to add to standard Gleason grade within our reports? Maria? Uh, I, uh, in the, um, we should select the biopsy and the uh, radical prostate specimen. In biopsy, it's important to to indicate the extension of the tumor um, in order to, to give the, uh, to, to have the in relationship with the clinical data, with the uh, instrumental data. And uh, I, I, I do not perform more of a, a histochemical analysis on a prostate biopsy. And uh, for the, uh, in the prostate um, uh, radical, in the uh, prostate uh, uh, specimen, I uh, give the information regarding the dimension of the tumor, in addition to the stage, of course, the dimension of the tumor, the presence of the main uh, nodule and the secondary nodule of the tumor. Of course, the, the stage uh, is a, uh, of course. 
Excellent. So thank you. Um, I think that in the interest of time, I will actually leave the word now to Professor Lopez Beltran, uh, who is of, of course uh, worldwide known for his uh, interest and in research in bladder cancer. So uh, Antonio, I will kindly ask you to uh, talk and to update us about novelties in bladder tumors within the last WHO classification. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Alberto, Maria, uh, Mahul. Uh, thank you to the uh, European Association uh, of Urology, School of, uh, of Urology, for uh, help us to organize this meeting in, uh, and try to share with uh, all of the urological community our interest in this urological uh, issues that uh, at this moment are very pathologically related. So if we talk about bladder, uh, first this, as you see here, this is my disclosure, not relevant, and my talk will be on novelties in bladder tumor. But this uh, talk is novelties in bladder tumor uh, in the context, in the context of what is relevant to the urologist, what are the novelties uh, that might be of interest for the for the urologist and uh, in terms of practicing. Okay, so um, this is uh, my introductory slide, in which uh, if you go to the right side of the screen, uh, there is uh, there are a number of points of practice and novelties that I have selected to share with you all uh, today. Uh, if we go to this um, uh, right side of the screen, uh, there are a number of points of practice and novelties uh, uh, related to this new WHO classification or new release. Uh, and these are divided in uh, uh, novelties uh, on uh, precursor lesions, uh, grading of uh, non-invasive tumors, uh, uh, a few uh, issues on invasive urothelial uh, carcinoma, and some uh, uh, advances in genomic that uh, are relevant to the WHO. Okay, this is a, a slide for um, a historical perspective. You see uh, to the left, you see the very old classic and still in use uh, a grading uh, system of the WHO for the bladder uh, published in 1973. And then you have uh, the right side and the uh, bottom, you see the new one. Uh, what is interesting, uh, I, I think this uh, new release is important for the uh, European uh, society that, uh, for instance, uh, Professor Montironi and Alessia uh, Sima de More uh, have been asked to write an editorial on that topic uh, uh, that is actually be, uh, or will be very polished very soon in the European uh, urology. Okay, okay. now I, I think you have a uh, with my uh, 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 keyboard uh, stamp problems. Okay, so if we go to these uh, uh, lesions, the, in the precursor lesions, what we notice is uh, in the slide we have here, we have uh, the, the, the classification, the previous uh, release of the WHO, you see uh, that included the so-called uh, uh, urothelial dysplasia, and the uh, so-called uh, papillary hyperplasia, also called as urothelial proliferation of uncertain malignant potential. These two terms disappear uh, from the uh, double, uh, the new classification, and that uh, it remains somehow. Let me show you the, in this way. So uh, concerning dysplasia, urothelial dysplasia, this is a term which is greatly debated. Uh, is controversial somehow. Uh, it is uncommon as the primary diagnosis. Uh, it is more frequently seen or reported in, in patients in biopsies uh, on follow-up, taking on follow-up of patients with low-grade urothelial uh, carcinoma 
or in the context of the follow-up of a, a eutherial carcinoma in situ. Uh, one of the problems with this uh, term is the, uh, the lack of precise uh, histology criteria. Uh, and unfortunately, there is a poor inter-observer reproducibility. Uh, the data uh, is on uh, follow-up on the meaning of this uh, lesion is uh, uncertain, let's say at this moment. What the WHO classification made was to uh, include uh, the previous definition, let's say preneoplastic lesion with cytological atypia, not definitive for the diagnosis of your filial carcinoma in situ. Uh, the, uh, the term does not have um, uh, a, a unique term, uh, a, a specific section during, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the book, in the, in the WHO uh, release, but um, the WHO uh, in a, a small paragraph uh, in the section of carcinoma in situ uh, recognizes that sometimes the term of dysplasia is needed because we need to explain a clinical situation and, and uh, unfortunately we do not have a better term so far. So that is uh, the reason they uh, thought it was better not to include it as a separate item, but also, uh, but only included at the paragraph inside the carcinoma in situ descriptions. Um, what are the point of practice that uh, urologists might need to uh, concerning this entity? The first one is not unique term, means it's not separated. And then uh, uh, important uh, clinically, uh, this term is going to solve situations in which we have a biopsy and non-inflammatory background. So we might reasonably say that that particular case is not reactive atypia, okay? It's something else. It's something that we feel in the WHO confirms this feeling that is more related to the oncologic process, the evolution of the disease, okay? But we still need to learn about that. Then we have um, uh, this term could potentially explain some molecular results uh, uh, or some cystoscopic finding uh, that could not be explained otherwise. So how to report at this moment? Uh, my view is that should be still reported as urothelial dysplasia until we have better terminology to define this clinical situation. Uh, the other uh, issue is the so-called papillary hyperplasia, the UPAMP in the WHO 2016. And, and this is, uh, I think, very relevant, both for pathologists and for urologists. This could be, could be clinical and biologically the, uh, the beginning of the papillary neoplasia. So uh, this is very few, probably the only one uh, uh, slide that I show you on histology. And this lesion you see here is a typical example of this papillary hyperplasia. You see, the lesion is uh, uh, described by some pathologists uh, as a tantin. Uh, um, some cystoscopies re re related to this lesion described as velvety, slightly uh, uh, red. So and why is that? Because the cisco at cystoscopy, the urologists identify mostly these small vessels which are behind, below the lesion, and that the uh, lesion that still don't have clearly formed papilla. So that is uh, something that we recognize and something that the urologists also recognize. So what we know about this uh, entity is in the past, in the, in the in the data that we have accumulated, we know that these frequently have uh, chromosome nine alterations. Uh, we know that some, at least some of them, they have 
feed fibrous growth factor receptor 3 mutations. Uh, we have uh, that most frequently is seen in patients uh, with history of uh, papillary urethral tumors. Uh, rare cases uh, uh, happen uh, as a primary setting. In those cases, we don't know the meaning of the lesion. And uh, uh, also when it is associated in the context of the follow-up of a patient with papillary neoplasia, we know that the risk of developing on follow-up of uh, uh, papillary carcinoma, it may reach uh, at up to 40%, some studies, which is very interesting. And uh, what, what the WHO did concerning this, this, uh, this clinical situation. Okay, again, they decided that there is no reason to include it as a separate term, as a unique diagnostic, uh, but they recognized in the general description of uh, uh, introductory description of the chapter, they uh, recognize that is, uh, this lesion is basically an early papillary neoplasia. So, but again, we might need the term. So it's something interesting that maybe we discuss later. So uh, the WHO, as mentioned, uh, uh, recognized that is potentially relevant. Uh, to me, it's also relevant in terms of molecular diagnosis, diagnosis of recurrence. Sometimes is what can explain the molecular findings. Uh, eventually could be used as a early therapy uh, diagnosis and how to report. My view is classic until we have a better term, I suggest to keep moving with the papillary urothelial hyperplasia. Something new, something recent. This particular uh, publication uh, will be soon uh, uh, published in modern pathology, uh, demonstrated a big number, a good number of uh, mutations in this lesion, uh, the third uh, promoter gene and the fibrillate growth factor receptor, and, and, but also a good number of cases showing both uh, type of mutation and, uh, and a good uh, the correlation between the finding in the hyperplastic lesion and the associated papillary neoplasia, which is very uh, interesting. And I suggest you to read this paper because can clarify uh, uh, many things concerning this uh, entity. So concerning grading, um, uh, the, finally, the WHO um, published the same system, uh, gives, gave uh, approach uh, uh, support to the low versus high grade grading system that uh, was initiated in 2000, 2004, uh, which I think is, uh, is good for the moment. Um, they recognize that the system is reproducible and it has uh, provide relevant uh, uh, management information. Uh, from the novelty's point of view, by the first time, the WHO has incorporated a cutoff to start calling a tumor as high grade. That is, I mean, that, that cutoff is more or equal to 5% of the tumor. This is not new. This is something that we have as pathologists using for the last 20 or 30 years or maybe more. And, but so far, WHO did not include it. And that was an addition to this new release in, in 2022, which is welcome and is good. Um, another interesting issue is uh, discussed in, in, in this new release is those low-grade carcinomas uh, with very minor component of high grade, minor than 5%. Okay, so uh, they, they were not actually rules to report that. The WHO have decided that this has related with the great heterogeneity. That might be interesting and important in the future. So what they, 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 they may be in, recognize that probably is not of big relevance, but they, let me show you, they uh, uh, decide that uh, all those low grade cases with minor less than 5% or, 
of high grade component should be reported. Okay, so why is that? Because reporting this category could give us more experience on the real meaning. Okay, that's rational. Um, what we know so far, uh, for instance, I quote this publication by the group of Professor Meto, which they show that the stage progression and the, diet, the death of the disease uh, is basically the same in this tumor compared with the pure low grade tumor. But they find out, uh, they found something curious, which is in those cases uh, uh, that were not treated with BCG, it happened a little, a little bit more uh, non-significant, but a little more uh, uh, great progression. So that is the rationale behind. But we know from uh, urological literature, the, I quote this Gottfried and Schubert papers showing actually they are not big relevance. So we need to run a little bit with this uh, uh, category, let's say, and learn on its uh, significance for future development. Uh, to me, this uh, made the question on, uh, shall we, uh, so I'm not talking myself, I'm putting the question to the urologist. So shall we, based on this, over-treat some of these patients? That is a question that is in my mind that I, I have not a solution, but maybe then we can discuss at some point. Another interesting issue uh, in these uh, urological tumors is that by the first time, not the first time, but by the, let's say more than the previous uh, editions, uh, uh, this new release have made emphasis on something that we have discussed over the years, is the uh, uh, prominent inverting growth pattern that we see in some of these tumors. And in those cases, uh, WHO recommend to report this uh, Morphology, uh, this uh, growth pattern. And, and concerning invasive urethelial carcinoma, these are only minor uh, uh, novelties. Uh, with we don't know yet uh, the significance. We'll have to learn about that. And this, the main uh, the main uh, uh, terminology issue is to change variant histology by the uh, name of subtypes. Okay is something that it is like this. Uh, they have uh, separated large nested from uh, the regular, the conventional nested, uh, and they have fused microcystic with the tubular, which also was included as a nested in the previous edition. Okay, let's see what, if it is clinically relevant in the future. We don't know yet. Uh, and the other question, uh, very minor things here, on um, plasmocytoid, very minor terminological things of uh, limited uh, clinical relevance in clear cell glycogenic. And then they also have separated the so-called the group of urethelial carcinoma with divergent, divergent differentiation, those with squamous, squamous glandular, and so on, uh, as a, a different group. So we finally have conventional urethelial carcinoma. We have subtypes of urethelial carcinoma, and then we have a third category, which is urethelial carcinoma with divergent differences. We'll see uh, if this is relevant for the clinical practice in the future. Just to remind all the clinical the, uh, urologists, the urologist community, that even those subtypes or variants uh, that look homogeneous to us under the microscope are molecularly heterogeneous, and that is something is important to keep in mind. And then the last uh, uh, piece of the presentation is related to genomic advances. So the WHO uh, recognizes the value of this uh, type of studies based on the taxonomy, based on the TCGA and so on, uh, uh, acknowledge its relevance in our practice that might be also relevant in clinical practice. So I, I choose this uh, slide from the paper of Robertson that you see clearly how some of these categories are related to uh, fibroblast growth factor inhibitors, uh, chemotherapy, 
PDO1 inhibitors, and so on. So that's, that is something important. Uh, again, the WHO also gives some credit to this uh, uh, molecular consensus molecular classification. But if you take a look to the right side of the screen, you see the, this compilation that I have performed. You see that this is not finished. This is not the end. Uh, there are new categories, new molecular groups, and even classifications coming and probably to come in the near future. And we need to learn about that from them. But something that uh, WHO made, made emphasis in the potential of immunohistochemistry for, uh, to be used for pathologists to establish, uh, to establish this question of a basal alumina, which is very interesting. Um, we have discussed this and uh, we assume that potentially uh, uh, if we could start by uh, incorporating our reports, these basic data on luminal and uh, basal by immunostochemistry that works quite well, uh, we might, uh, the urologist and the oncologist could start having experience on these uh, categories and see what happened. Uh, by the first time, uh, the WHO has incorporated data on PDL1 assessment, which is also very good and very welcome uh, to us. And just to the end, there are, in addition to the classic urethelial uh, uh, categories, we have some other uh, squamous, glandular, and with very, um, let's say, the, uh, uh, only terminological issues, which are also relevant. But for instance, to me, it's important that we, we have now a diverticular carcinoma as a category because we can learn more about these uh, subtypes, the, these categories in the, uh, and the clinical relevance of these in the future. We have more information on urethral, which is not uh, the topic of today, and something else. So, so the conclusion, the conclusion, no, the take home message, the message that you can bring your home uh, are the WHO mostly refined previously uh, uh, developed concepts with minor modifications in both infiltrating and papillary neoplasm. Uh, urethelial dysplasia is not considered a unique term, but uh, the WHO recognized uh, uh, the clinical value in certain cases, in certain situations. Uh, papillary urethelial uh, hyperplasia is not considered a unique term anymore, but this, its biological significance is also recognized by the WHO. Uh, the presence of minor high-grade component in a low-grade tumor should be reported. Uh, the WHO addressed the potential clinical value of the molecular taxonomy of bladder cancer, and the report to data suggests that several assays used to, 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 to assess this PDL1 and immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy uh, may be used uh, interchangeable, and that is very important and a good news to us. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Antonio. This was, as always, uh, an excellent presentation about novel disease in bladder cancer. Unfortunately, we have a bit run out of time, uh, and, uh, and, but the information and the data you gave us were so important that, that I believe we did have, indeed, a fantastic update by you guys about uh, novelties uh, and, uh, and, uh, and updates. And, and we, we, I would like to congratulate with you all with these fantastic presentations. I personally learned a lot. So on behalf of the speakers, I would like actually to thank the EAU and the ESU for this fantastic effort and to put together pathologists and urology to, urologists together with the effort or really uh, face uh, with uh, a multidisciplinary approach, our GU cancers. And this is indeed uh, a, 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 an important feature uh, that uh, we need to deal every day with. Uh, again, uh, thank you all and thank you for the audience and for the for participants for being here with us today. And we wish you all uh, a nice continuation of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.